Matthew chapter number 8. Let's stand and we'll, we'll read our text this morning. Matthew chapter number 8, verse number 1. <clears throat> when he was come down from the mountain, so here he's finished up his sermon on the mount. Uh, looking at that for a few weeks now, he says, Great multitudes followed him. A peculiar thing about Jesus Christ, you'll see it again in verse number 18, is he never seems to be all that concerned about the multitudes. It's a funny thing. It's almost like if you watch him, he has an aversion to the multitudes because they're following him. He's walking away. If you look at verse 18, it says, When he saw the great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. <laughs> Sees the multitudes, and he, it seems like he has an aversion to the multitudes, although he has compassion on the individuals, on the sheep not having a shepherd. But watch this now. You see him mentioning the multitudes. They're following him, but he's ignoring them because here's what I believe. Why? Why does the gate that leads to destruction? A lot of people are following the Lord, but they don't really want him. They don't really want help. It's like it's more of the what's in it for me kind of a deal. It's just curiosity. It's just something to do. But in verse number 2, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus saith unto him, See thou, tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So he didn't need to be under the law. He wasn't doing it for the sake of this, the transition period from the law, but he's saying, be a testimony to them. Go, go, go do what they think you need to be doing to be a testimony. Verse 5, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Amen to that. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. You see it? A Jewish kingdom? A literal, visible kingdom? But the children of the kingdom, the Jews, shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what he's saying is a lot of the Israelites, it's I'm their king, it's their kingdom, they're rejecting, and if they reject, they're going to go to hell. But there's ones that aren't even from the kingdom that are going to come in and sit down in a Jewish kingdom. So there will be Jews there. This isn't saying the Jews are gone for good. It's saying those of you that are rejecting are going to lose, lose out. And here's this Gentile centurion. He's getting in on something that's not even his. Thank God for that. Amen. That's you and I. Verse 14. And when, uh, uh, wait a second. Verse 13. And Jesus said to the centurion, go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. And when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid sick of a fever. Now hang on a minute. Peter's supposedly the first pope, right? Peter's what? His mother-in-law. Peter was married. It just takes a little bit of Bible to clean up all kinds of religious confusion. You just got to read. That's all. It's literally that simple. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. And Peter's, Jesus come into Peter's house and he saw his wife's mother laid in a sick of a fever. And he touched her hand. And the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. And when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities... And bear our sicknesses. Now you're going to notice in verse number 2, the leper when he shows up, and I, and I, I know you're standing, just give me a minute. The leper when he shows up comes and he worships him. 
before he's even healed of his leprosy. He shows up to Jesus Christ and it says the first thing he does is he worships the Lord Jesus Christ and then he says to him, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. So he has a serious issue we're going to look at in just a second. And the issue is not fixed yet, but he's still already without an answer to prayer, without the solution being there, without knowing whether or not Jesus is going to say yes or no to what he's going to ask. He says, if thou wilt, thou canst. So he knew Jesus Christ could heal him, but he didn't know whether or not Jesus was going to yet. And he's still worshiping anyways before he asked the question, ain't that something? And then Jesus Christ touches him. Then in verses 5 through verse number 12, it goes down through verse 13, but in verses 5 through 10, you've got the centurion coming to Jesus Christ, and he's saying, Lord, my servant's lying at home, and he's grievously tormented. Lord, I need your help. And the Lord says, listen, I'm coming right now. The Lord, the Lord knew who he was talking to. He's God, right? And the centurion noticed his attitude. He says, listen, the, the humility of this man, I'm not worthy that you should even walk into my house. Folks, we're not worthy that the Lord should even show up and speak to us this morning. But he's still willing to walk right in if we'll have him. And he says, no, I'm not worthy. Hey, listen, Lord, just speak the word. And the Lord said, my goodness, man. All right, it's done. And then the third person in the text that gets dealt with is Peter's mother-in-law and she's laying up in Peter's house and the Lord walks in there and the Lord sees her sick of the fever and he touches her and he heals her. You see nothing in there at all about her going to him or anything at all. He just shows up, sees the need and he fixes the need. And then the fourth group in verses 16 and 17 are those people possessed of devils. Here's a crowd that Nobody can really do anything with. They're possessed of some things much mightier than any man can handle. And Jesus Christ, with his word, is helping them out. Just like that. The message this morning is going to be, when you can't, God can. Let's pray. Father, I ask you now to speak to our hearts this morning. I pray that you'd help this passage come alive. I pray, Lord, that you'd fill me with your spirit, that I would get out of your way. Lord, I'm honored to be here this morning, but I don't feel at all like I'm by any stretch of the imagination worthy to be up in front of your people and opening your word and even to ask you to show up, but I am asking you to come. Even ask you to use me, but I am asking you to use me. And I ask you, Father, to please control me and help me, Lord, to be a blessing and a help and encouragement to the people that are here this morning. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When you can't, Jesus can. The first thing you're going to see is in verse number two, when you have a problem that needs cleaning up and you can't clean up, Jesus can clean you up. This leper comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and he's worshiping him. He says, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. You have to understand the gravity of what's happening to this man. Leprosy in the Old Testament is a type of God's judgment on sin. When somebody became a leper, that was, that was outward proof that that was a wicked person and God was judging that individual. This person comes to Jesus Christ and they say, listen, I got a problem that's getting out of control. I got an issue that I can't seem to get under wraps. This thing is tearing me up. It's destroying me. It has affected every relationship in my life. And I don't like what's happening, and I can't stop what's happening, and nobody can help me. Jesus, if you can help me, I know you can do it. And if you will, I want to be clean. I don't know if there's anybody here this morning that can relate to this leper, but I'll tell you this much. Every last one of you, whether you realize it or not, you are a sinner. And if you've never been born again, that's the first and foremost thing. You've got to understand you have leprosy. It shows one year at a time as your body ages and gets older. I know some of the young people and the children in the room, you don't think you're, you're dying, but you are. I know now you're growing and you're getting stronger and things seem to be improving, but they're really not. 
Because before you know it, you're going to look in the mirror and still feel like you're 15 and you're not going to be 15. The mirror is going to tell you the truth. You know what you're seeing? You're seeing an outward representation of an inward problem. And the inward problem is something in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. We all have a sin problem. We all have this leprosy and should be able to relate to the leper in verse number two. Because I'm telling you right now, there is nowhere to run. There is nowhere to hide. Sin will get you. It'll hunt you down. It'll haunt you. It'll possess you. It'll take control of you. And without Jesus Christ, you have have no hope of escaping eternity in the lake of fire. Amen. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? You know everybody here this morning. And man, it's sure good to see some people we ain't seen in a long time, man. What a blessing. Seeing the Aikens walk in, and I tried not to cry because I didn't want to feel like a girl, but I was about to cry, man. It's been a blessing, boy. You know everybody as far as you know everybody's saved. Yeah, but in a room this size, there's probably one or two that aren't. I want you to know when it comes to sin, no amount of good works can help you out. No amount of religion can help you out. Although religion will always try to present it to the leper like we're here to clean you up and we're here to help you with that issue. In all reality, they're only making the matter worse. When it's always this works-based salvation, if my good works outweigh my bad works, you're magnifying the sin. You're focusing on the sin. And the more you claim to be trying to outwork your sin, the worse your sin gets because pride comes in there. And now you not only have sins of the flesh, you got sins of the spirit as well because religion without Jesus Christ is damnation. No matter how you cut it, you've got to have some help with that leprosy. Beyond that, Christian, as sad as this might be, salvation, although it takes care of the eternal guilt of sin, although your hell has been paid for, you're secure, and you're on your way to heaven, guess what? There are some things that will haunt you as long as you're in the flesh. When you get the victory over one thing, you'll find out something else is an issue. It seems like the closer you get to Jesus Christ and the closer you get and the more you get into the Bible and really the Bible has a way of cleaning you up. It's just absolutely amazing. But the more it cleans you up and you start getting victory in some areas through the help of Jesus Christ and you seem like your leprosy over here is getting under control, other things start springing up. It may not be the same stuff as it was when you were a kid, but now you're starting to realize my issues ran deeper than I knew. I have problems in my mind and I'm not talking about being a pervert. That's child's play. I got problems with the way I think. I got problems with my envy. I got problems with my pride. I need help. Amen. Lord, I cannot get clean, man. The more I see you, the more I realize how dirty I am, and I want to be clean. I want to fellowship with my Savior. I want to get in my Bible and have that thing popping to me, man. I want to wake up sometimes before my alarm, and be so excited about getting in my Bible and wanting to hear from God that I voluntarily get myself out of bed to grab my Bible and hope God's going to say something. But man, we got so much sin in us, it's like the Lord is so far in the background. Our relationship with Him is so far gone. Our prayer life is so dead. I ain't had an answer to prayer in five or ten years. I'll bet you some of you ain't had an answer. I'm not harping on you. I'm trying to help you this morning. But I'll bet you some of you it's been a long time since you've had an answer to prayer. Kind of got quiet right there. Don't you know God answers prayers? Amen. Wouldn't it be great to have that happen? Yeah. This leper had some issues. In order to understand fully what's going on here, you've got to go back with me, if you would, to the book of Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. I want to show you how leprosy in your Old Testament is a type of sin. How this man really publicly was an outcast. Publicly, this man is known to be a sinner and nobody would have anything to do with him. First of all, understanding that it's a type of sin. In Numbers chapter 12, look at verse number 1. And Miriam and Aaron spake, unto Moses, spake against Moses excuse me, because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Miriam and Aaron, his brother and sister, family members, criticizing Moses because of his wife. Very typical thing here. I mean, if any of you have families, if any of you have in-laws, brothers or sisters, you understand this is pretty normal stuff for all of us? 
And so here, Mary, Miriam and Aaron, they're making fun of, they're criticizing, they're bad-mouthing Moses, and, and it's how the devil works. He goes after the weaker vessel, so the issue is, is, is her. You know, the issue, she's the problem. And I don't know how this all worked out or why or what the details were. I just know they were talking against Moses because of his wife. Just stop for one quick second. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have been Moses' wife? Not only are you not one of the crowd culturally speaking, but on top of that, your husband is called of God to lead a whole nation through a wilderness. Can you imagine how much she had to give up her husband to everybody else who all demanded his attention? And on top of all that, she's probably there. I mean, if, if I know anything about this kind of a thing, you know, she, time to time he comes home pretty tore out of the frame because of dealing with those rebellious people and they're complaining and they're murmuring and the stupidity going on and he's all aggravated but you know when he's at the church he's got to be nice to him to try to be gracious and he can't really say everything he wants to say but boy when you walk in the door of the house well why are you taking your frustrations with everybody else out on me I'm just saying can you imagine being his wife on top of that, all the eyes of Israel are on you. Every woman in Israel is looking at you. Just a sidebar here, I'm not going to run this rabbit down. But it's a strange phenomenon to me to watch women who really want their husbands to be in positions of leadership. See, I know I'm on something when it gets quiet. To watch mamas who really want to call their sons to preach. You are playing with fire. If your little boy comes to me and says that God's called me to preach, I'm going to say, sounds good, man. You do whatever God wants you to do. I'm not going to prop him up one way, push him one way, encourage him one way or the other. That's too much to mess with. That is God's business, not mine. I do not have a desire for my daughters to marry preachers or to marry missionaries. And God help me, I won't get in their way if God does that for them. Hey, listen, that's more than you want to take on yourself. You better know God's in it before you want that. Because guess what? He's the leader, but you're going to have everybody else watching you. And so every so often, all the other women can be a little bit off. Their game emotionally, being very, very tactful this morning, aren't I? But you know what I'm talking about. Every so often, women have a little bit more of a hard time being sweet. They look at you and they see a knife going across your kind of a deal, you know? <laughs> and everybody else has that right, but it's like, <laughs> you know Moses' wife, I don't mess with her. You want that position? Be careful. Here she is, she's got a lot on her plate. She's got a bunch going on. And all they can do is go, he married an Ethiopian, she ain't like us. They said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? So they're just talking to each other. They're just grumbling. They're just complaining. They're just kind of setting that thing up. You see, what we're talking about here is not fornication. We're not talking about adultery. We're not talking about, you know, Miriam and Moses were smoking dope in the back of the temple and, you know, the, you know, the tabernacle and, you know, drink, getting drunk and fornicating. We're not talking about it. We're talking about stuff that we don't normally even recognize as sin. Just a little criticism of somebody else. Just a... You do it, I do it, we all do it. It's okay. When somebody criticizes you, don't go off the deep end. It's whatever, man. I, okay, I criticize them too. That's fair, you know. It's all good. Every one thing you got to say about me, I got five things to say about you. <laughs> but it's still sin, folks. It's still displeasing to God. It's still an uncleanness that really we like. I mean, we like to be in people's business. How is it that something as, as abstract as social media has become such a lucrative thing? Because you like that, see, you like that leprosy being in everybody else's business. Verse 3, now the man of Moses was very meek above, above all the men which were on the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. 
And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. I think that's interesting. God will deal with you, brother, if he's called you to preach. He'll talk to you. And I'll tell you the most part, he ain't going to tell your wife. You're going to have to tell her. And all reality... When God's really in it, she's going to be like, huh? Did you just say you want a divorce or did you say you want to die? God said, if I got a man, I will deal with him. Watch. Verse 7, my, Moses, my servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all my house. He said, if I got a prophet, I'll deal with him in a vision. I'll speak to him personally in a dream. But not Moses. When I talk to Moses, verse 8, with him will I speak mouth to mouth even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So God said, listen, with Moses, he ain't like all the other prophets. That man, I'm telling you, I'm, he's my servant. And when I talk to him, I'm talking to him directly. And I'm letting him get as close to laying eyes on me as anybody's ever going to get because that's me and Moses. We're that close. You just didn't know it because he's a meek man. He's not walking around bragging about his relationship with me. But you two messed up family members messing up because they're so close. This goes back to Sunday afternoon that thank God we didn't live stream, but that got real good. Man, those questions rung a bell. I've been getting feedback all week, even as much as last, yesterday afternoon on Sunday afternoon's deal because we all kind of have more in common than you'd think. <laughs> Family was picking him apart and God's saying, I know you're close to him, but so am I. I know you know the inside scoop about Moses that everybody else doesn't know and him and his wife, the Ethiopian, and how she showed up and didn't bring any food and she doesn't do the laundry enough and she didn't clean the tent, sweep the tent out enough and she's not good enough for Moses, but Moses loves her. I know she's an Ethiopian, but if I had an issue with his interracial marriage, I'd have told him I had an issue with it. So if I'm not saying nothing, why are you? See the situation? We're talking about sin here, folks. And sin that's so presumptuous, sin that's so easy, she didn't even realize what she was doing. He didn't even realize what he was doing. They were just in it before they knew what was going on, just being normal human beings with opinions and having lived long enough to have something to say. But in somebody else's business and not realizing they had gravely overstepped between them and God. So what does the Lord do? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he's gone. All of a sudden, he just, boom, he's there. Hey, got something to say. He says it, boom, he's out. And as soon as he's gone, the cloud departed, verse 10, from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam, just like that, became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, let not the sin, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And God was good enough to do it. But you see here in your Old Testament, when somebody's leprous, it is a bad deal between them and God. Let me show you something even more. Go to Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. So back one book to your left. Let me show you something a little more about the leprosy. Look at Leviticus chapter number 13. Go down with me, if you would, please, to verse number 42. Leviticus 13, 42. And if there be in the bald head or bald forehead a white reddish sore, it is a leprosy sprung up in his bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall look upon it. And behold, if the rising of the sore be white reddish in his bald head or his bald forehead, as the leprosy appeareth in the skin of the flesh, he is a leprous man, he is unclean, the priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean, his plague is in his head. Notice verse 43, the priest shall look upon it, not touch it. You understand that? The priest could not touch 
the leprosy. Not even the God's man. Not even the one there to help him in the temple worship. He can't touch it. Do you remember when we read the text, Jesus did what to the leper? He touched him. You see, when man can't, God can. When you can't, Jesus can. But you understand now why the Pharisees and the scribes had such a hard time with Jesus Christ. Because they know this rule and they know the priest can't touch him. But he just touched a leper. That ain't right. He violated the law. But he didn't. Because when man can't, Jesus can. Watch the text. Look at verse 46. And all the days when his plagues shall be in him, he shall be defiled. You see, he's defiled by sin. God says, don't touch him. Get away from him. Avoid him. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall be his habitation. I meant to read to you verse 45. Let's do that. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent and his head bare. And he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and he shall cry, unclean, unclean. So what he's to do is he's to mark himself and make sure that as he moves through town, he's got a covering on his lips, and he's saying, unclean, unclean, and people are getting out of the way because they don't want that leprosy. So everywhere he goes, everybody knows, unclean, unclean, I'm a sinner, I'm being judged, get out of the way, get away from me, and even the priest can't touch him. Nobody can help him because he's unclean. But when no man can, God can't. When man can't, Jesus Christ can. And he touches the leper and heals him. Now, how did he do that without breaking the law? Because if he broke the law, he's a sinner. And Jesus ain't a sinner. You see the predicament you're in? You see the problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all the rest of the religious idiots that don't understand how Jesus works? They don't have a clue. A little bit of Bible will fix it up for us and we'll look at it. If you would, please go down with me to verse number 50. And the priest shall look upon the plague, see it, not touch it, and shall shut up it that hath the plague seven days. So this is even when it gets in his garment and all the rest of that stuff. It's just nasty. It's permeating everything. He shall look on the plague on the seventh day. If the plague be spread in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof or in the skin or in any work that is made of skin, the plague is a fretting leprosy. It is unclean. He shall therefore burn that garment, whether warp or woof, in woolen or in linen, or, in, or anything of skin wherein the plague is, for it is a fretting, fretting leprosy. It shall be burnt in the fire. Excuse me? You better get help for your uncleanness. Because if you don't have help from Jesus Christ, if you've never been touched by Jesus Christ and cleaned of your sin, you're going to the lake of fire. That's the only way to handle sin that's not been cleaned up. You've got to burn it. Christian, if you've already been to the cross and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you have forgiveness for your sin, listen to me. When you get to the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, if you still got some stuff he's been dealing with you about and you ain't got it right, your works are going to be burned up. Yet he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You better figure out how to handle this uncleanness. And you can't, but Jesus can Go to chapter 14 in Leviticus, please, chapter number 14. Let me show you why Jesus Christ touched it. Because when Jesus Christ showed up and he touched him, he immediately gets cleaned. So how is it Jesus did that without breaking the law, without doing something wrong? Watch this. Leviticus chapter number 14, uh, please, and we're going to look at verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest. Do you guys ever read this stuff in your devotions and go, why in the world is this in here? I'm showing you. It's amazing. It's amazing how this Bible opens up when you stay in church and you keep stay in that book and you listen to preaching. Watch. This is the law of the leopard in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest. And the priest shall go forth out of the camp. And the priest shall look. And behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper... Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds, alive and clean, and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel, watch it, over running water. What boring Old Testament stuff. What's this all about? Wait. 
As for the living bird, he shall take it, and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. For the sake of time, skip down with me to verse 13. And he shall slay the lamb in the place where he shall kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. The priest just touched him. Do you know how the priest touched him? Through the blood. You see in verse number 5, watch it, he's killed over running water. You kill the bird over running water. You get the water running, you slay the bird. When you slay the bird, blood comes out, right? You know what you've got a mix of? Blood and water. You take the other bird, you dip the live bird in the blood and water, and you set the live bird free, covered in blood and water. Is anybody getting it yet? You know what happened to Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary? His blood was shed. When they came by to check him to see if he was dead, they pierced him through his side, and the Bible says blood and water came out. Hey, do you remember the spirit descended from heaven like a dove? You got a bird, you got blood and water, you got a lamb, you got blood, you got a priest touching him for the blood's sake. Jesus touched him because he was the lamb. And he had a right to touch him. And when he touched him, he could heal him because he can do it through the blood. You got sin problems? You need a touch from Jesus Christ. You got struggles in your life? You got problems in your life? I'm talking anything. I'm talking it can be addiction. It can be addiction with your eyeballs. It can be substance. It can be anything else you want to talk about. Anything going on that you've been trying to get victory over. It keeps coming back and hunting you. I'm telling you, when you can't, Jesus Christ can. But you got to ask him like that leper did. You got to humble yourself like that leper did. You got to be ready to take whatever answer he gives you and be willing to worship him, even if he doesn't clean you up like you want him to. A lot of people struggle for a long time before they get the victory but don't you quit struggling because when you can't Jesus Christ can and he can love you even when you won't love yourself you see why he touched him you understand now that he wasn't breaking the law in any way shape or form Jesus Christ was fulfilling the law he's the lamb that can touch him he's that that bloodshed and he knew he could he didn't do anything wrong they just didn't understand what he was doing Back in Matthew chapter number 8, he can clean you up. Jesus Christ can clean you of your leprosy. And boy, I'm telling you, I want that touch. I need it. Number two, Jesus Christ can cure your acquaintances. And verse number five, Jesus is entering into Capernaum. And we read this story already. The centurion comes to him. He's beseeching the Lord. He's begging the Lord. He's getting down on his face. He's coming in an appropriate way, a humble way. He's saying, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy. And he's grievously tormented. He loved his servant. The palsy is some kind of a muscular problem. It's a paralysis. He said he lieth at home. So some kind of a problem hit this servant. And now he can't get up and move around anymore on his own. He's got a paralyzation. On top of that, you imagine if you were paralyzed, having to lay there all the time, and you sweat, and you get the bed sores, and all the rest of what's going on. This centurion loved this servant, man. He's taking care of his servant. He's a good man. Interestingly enough, and I won't chase this down, but it's just out there for you if you want to look it up. Look up centurions in your New Testament. You'll be surprised that all the times God seems to be pretty complimentary toward them. They always seem to have some kind of a character. It's interesting. They're soldiers. The Lord has a special place in his heart for them kind of guys. It's the discipline. Fishermen, hardworking men, women that are trying to make it without a man to help them. You see, don't say this stuff that church is, you know, church, well, you know, church is for younger folks. This church is a good church for young people. What? Oh, it's a good church for older people. What are you talking about? That's a good church for single people. That's a good church for families. Listen to me. It's a good church for everybody that wants the truth. Amen. That's what we're about. He's over here and he's, he's a centurion. He doesn't, but the Lord has respect for him. The Lord's helping him out. 
The Lord's helping out the single woman. The Lord recognizes that character and he sees the centurion comes to him and the centurion says, hey, listen, my servant's lying at home sick of the palsy and he says, I, I, I'm coming to your house right now. Just like that, Jesus is like, I'm coming. He says, I'm not worthy for you to come under my house. There might have been some things at home he didn't want Jesus to know about. Might have been some things at home he didn't want Jesus to see. Aren't you glad the Lord loves sinners? Even though he judges sin, and that scares me half out of my mind, I'm glad he still loves sinners. He loves me, and he loves you, and he's willing to show up when you need help. Nobody could help that servant. If the centurion could, he would have. He's got people, servants, taking care of the servant. He's got nurses there, and all they can do is try to make him comfortable. They say, I'm sick of watching him suffer, Lord. He's grievously tormented. I'm sick and tired of watching this, God. I've had about enough of it. There's nowhere else I can go. I got him the best treatment I can get him, and nobody can help my servant. And he cared about him. But you realize when no man can help him, Jesus can? You got some people you care about? You got some people you've tried to help and you can't help them? Jesus can. I'm thankful for that. I don't know if he will or not. I'm ready to worship him either way. But I'm sure glad he can. And you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to quit trying to get him to help him. I'm going to keep getting to him and talking to him about him. I'm going to keep bringing to him the situation and saying, Lord, listen, I need somebody to help out my servant. I care about this person. This man has the right spirit when he approaches the Lord. He recognizes his own unworthiness. He's not coming to him like a spoiled brat. He's groveling. He's a soldier, and he's groveling before Jesus Christ on behalf of something else. What is in it for the centurion? He's fine. He's got a good career. Everything's going great. He's got the character he needs to make things happen for himself. What is in it for him? I see nothing in it for the centurion, and yet he's so burdened about somebody he cares about and the need that they have. He's tired of watching them suffer, and he's like, Lord, help him, please. Amen. The Lord says, I'm coming. Instead of saying, oh, man, everybody's going to see Jesus came to my house. He's saying, no. No, no, no. Let's just keep this between us. If you speak the word, it'll be done. You know what I noticed about the centurion? He says, I'm a man under authority. You see that in the text? And I have people under me. Ain't that interesting? This is not a man with an authority problem. This is a man who's a boss, who is the big shot, but he's the boss because he's earned it, because he understands leadership, because he's got character. And he says, listen, I might be the boss in all these areas, but I realize I'm not a boss unto myself. I have somebody I answer to. I am under authority, and I have people under my authority. And when I tell people under my authority to do something, they do it. So God, Jesus is God. So God, if you just say it, I know it'll get done. And Jesus said, my goodness, no touch this time. No walking up and putting his hand on it this time. He said, speak the word only. This centurion's got so much faith in God's word that he's saying, if you'll just speak to my acquaintance's heart, if you'll just work on their heart, nobody can help them but your word can. And guess what happens to the centurion's servant? Because Jesus can. The next one that Jesus can help is Peter's mother-in-law. Now it gets a little more personal. You know why you're asking the questions you're asking Sunday afternoon? Because you hurt. You might be so mad at your family that you want to choke them half to death. Can I get a witness? You might occasionally think about murder. <laughs> Don't do it. You think about it. You know. <laughs> but you wouldn't ask the question if it didn't bother you. Because you care. And then you're in a bad position as a Christian when you're trying to do right and you've got people in your life that aren't trying to do right. And no matter what you do, you know they're going to do nothing but cause trouble. 
and you're all jammed up. Aren't you glad the Bible, there's more to it than just forgive, 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 forgive. There's a lot more to that book than that. I thank God for it. My mother-in-law's got a mess. You know what's going on in her, Lord? She's got a fever. You could see the effects of it, and it kind of comes and goes in waves. Anybody ever had a fever before? Don't, don't raise your hand, COVID, everybody's going to, the church will be gone, and everybody will be <laughs> vacant next week. It kind of comes and goes in waves. It spikes up and drops down. Something inside that you can't necessarily see, you don't know what it is or why, but it's something inside that's bothering you, and the effects of it from time to time overwhelm you and begin to take you over. But it's something that no man can put their finger on and no man can help. And Peter's got her at home, and he's trying to do the best he can to take care of her. I don't know where her husband is. She's at Peter's house, so maybe she's a widow by now. But he's trying to take care of his mother-in-law, and I'm sure his wife had to be stressed to the max. And there she is worried, and he's trying to follow the Lord and everything else going on in his life, trying to juggle all the balls he's got going and keep everything up in the air at one time. And the Lord just walks in and sees the situation his disciples, mother-in-law's in, and he reaches over and he touches her. And just like that. When nobody could, Jesus came. I remember the stories, and I, forgive me if uh, you've heard it before, but my dad got saved, I think he was about 19 years old. And he got sure enough saved. He was a good altar boy, and a good alcoholic, good at both. Devout Roman Catholic. Long, flowing hair. He got saved, he went home, and he called a family meeting. He's got three brothers, I think, and a sister. So it's five of them total. Brung his mom and dad in there, sat him down, told him what happened to him. And you all are getting saved. He's preaching the gospel to him, right? They thought he lost his mind, like he's going through some kind of an issue or something like that. Well, long story short, all of my dad's brothers eventually wound up getting saved. My dad's sister got saved. My dad's brothers are all married to born-again Christians. Their wives are all saved. My dad's sister's husband got saved. My dad's parents got saved staunch Roman Catholics. Both of his parents got saved. Divorce, split home, big mess, all kinds of, more problems than most of us have, or maybe, maybe not, but you know, <laughs> big mess. I don't even know how many cousins I have. I'm pretty sure I could count them up. I think Uncle Dave had three boys and a girl. I forget how many Uncle Paul had. I think it was something like seven. You're not in touch with your family? Yeah, my family's as much as a soup sandwich as yours is. I don't know. They go different directions. We live all over the place. What do you want me to do? I don't know what to tell you. But on top of that, Aunt Mary had four, uh, three boys and a girl. Uh, there's Uncle Paul, Uncle Don, Uncle Dave. Uncle Don had two, a boy and a girl. A bunch of them are married now, and as far as I know, their kids are all getting saved. I mean, you got, got them on the mission field, got a doctor. Come out of our family, a doctor, mission field. One was a big-time Southern Gospel, singing Southern Gospel groups, traveling all over. You all have heard him on your Pandora. You just don't know it because he's, uh, he's half Filipino, so you wouldn't never know he's a Reagan. But, yeah, he's on there. I mean, it's amazing to see what God's done. It's amazing to see how God can touch a family. And I'll tell you this much. My dad will tell you himself. He didn't do it all right at first. He came in like a bull in a china shop. said, listen, the Reagan men are a mess, and the male Reagan curse is over right now. We're not going to perpetuate what's been going on for generations around here. It's like, you know, that ain't going to work. <laughs> Start an Irish war. But when a man can't, God can. I got, I got the, all over. They all got saved, man. My mom got saved. My grandma and grandpa, uh, Camerata, staunch Roman Catholics. And my grandpa Camerata hated my dad. It might have been reciprocated. I wouldn't say, I mean, you know, either way, Grandpa's in heaven, so he'll forgive me, but Dad's still alive, so, you know, got to be careful. But hated my dad. I, I remember, I remember standing there at the family get-togethers like, because oh, Grandpa was a professional boxer, and he always worked out, and he had a flat nose, and he had surgeries on his eyes from where all the damage had been done, plastic surgeries, eyelids were all kind of, I mean, just, just as cool as they come, man. You don't get any better than that. Grandson looking up to your Grandpa like that, he can whoop anybody. And there was my dad, six foot two. I remember stand, him standing there like this. He wouldn't back down. He'd die before he'd back down. And grabs, I want to hear him. I'm thinking, oh. A mess, man. A mess. Grandpa said, don't you ever bring up your God again. 
Don't you talk about your God. I don't want to hear about your religion. And they thought his pastor was a nut that thought he was in a cult. Furious at my dad for taking their only daughter out of the Catholic Church. No man can. But Jesus can. He said, don't bring up your God again. And dad said, okay, see you next weekend. We were over there all the time. It was ridiculous, this Italian stuff, you know, Mamma Mia, you know. He'll be here next week. Oh, okay, can't wait to come. My dad must have been a better man than me because I would have said, hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? Grandpa goes into the Catholic church and brings his Bible and is sitting there reading his Bible and the priest stops him on the way out the door and says, hey, don't bring your Bible, John. Listen to me. Grandpa's like, huh? Grandpa tells mom and dad, they told me not to bring my Bible, but listen to them. They said, that's interesting because our preacher says, open your Bible and turn to chapter and verse, and we follow along while he preaches. Amen. See what I'm saying? And then you said, don't bring mom. No problem. Didn't talk about God. I just compared. It's wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. He goes to the, grandpa was a horrible alcoholic by the way. Horrible alcohol. He had a pattern down that he'd work the thing out to where nobody knew because there was always the same amount of beers in the fridge. But he worked midnights. So he could come in late while they were still asleep and get tanked up, sit in the bathroom with the door shut, pretending like he's going to the bathroom for an hour and a half while he got hammered. And go make sure he rotated them, put the empties in the truck and bring the new ones and make sure the same amount of beers were always in the fridge. A horrible alcoholic. Hiding it the whole time. Functional, but hiding it the whole time. Some of you are smiling. Yeah. God can. The, the priest says, we're going to have that little fair thing or whatever they do. He said, John, I want you to run the beer tent. The priest knew he was an alcoholic and knew he had gotten clean. And he said, I ain't running the beer tent. I can't even smell apple cider vinegar without wanting to get drunk. So they didn't go to dad's church. They went to the Nazarene church. Because when you can't, God can might not go to the son-in-law's church yet, but I'm going to the Nazarene church. Guess what they got in the Nazarene church? They got saved. I know some of you don't think that's possible, but they did. They got saved in the Nazarene church. Then guess what? Uncle Joe winds up getting saved. Uncle Johnny winds up getting saved. Uncle Joe's wife winds up getting saved. My cousins, I believe, made a profession of faith. It's unbelievable what God's done. I've named over 50, somewhere between 50 and 100 people that got saved, and it wasn't possible from a human standpoint. But when you can't, Jesus can. I never forget Uncle Joe. He's in heaven now. Uncle Joe wasn't our stripe. He was charismatic. And boy, he was off the deep end. He was having the preacher speak the word over him while he was dying of cancer and it didn't work, but he kept having him speak the word over him. And I loved Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe loved me, and I don't know why, but I'd stop by, just drop in on him every so often, knock on the door, and he'd say, Come in! Come in! Don't knock on the door, you idiot! <laughs> My parents were super formal, and Uncle Joe was not formal. A little bit shorter than me. Had all his teeth pulled because he hated dentists. He was scared of them. He said, don't work on my teeth, just pull them out. So he'd inset like that, teeth up front. He chewed, he loved steak, and he just chewed. I said, how do you chew steak, man? He said, I just dumb it to death. <laughs> Fu Manchu, 80s hair, wallet chain, skinny as a rail, veins popping out of his arm, and 130 pounds at that, but strong as an ox. Just a little tiny guy, but just a nut, just a spaz. Come in, you idiot! Come in. He said... <laughs> What's going on, you stupid blank? I can't tell you what he would say because it's not appropriate. But what's going on, you stupid blank? Every time he saw me, that was, that was his greeting. And I just loved it. It was very endearing. Really, it was a thing. I live still to this day. I think about it. I start laughing. What's going on, you stupid blank? You're dumber than a box of rocks. Sit down. That was our relationship. And I hang out and talk. And you know, I know where he's at today. Because ain't nobody could ever reach Uncle Joe. You ain't just, let me just, I... <laughs> Ain't nobody could ever reach Uncle Joe. If he walked in here, you'd all scatter. Sicilian, that big old Sicilian nose and that Fu Manchu, and he'd make Johnny scared. Johnny'd run from him. <laughs> Guess where he is? He's in heaven. Because Jesus can. I'm trying to tell you this morning, you got some people that you want to see God reach, and you don't think it can happen. You need some help, and you don't think you're going to get the help. 
And I'm not here to promise you that you will, but I'll tell you this much, when you can't, Jesus Christ can. I don't want you to give up on what the Lord can do. I don't want you to stop praying for your loved ones. I don't want you to stop praying for your co-workers. I don't want you to burn the bridges if they say, don't talk to me about your God anymore, saying, fine, then I'll talk to my God about you. But hey, Jesus Christ can. So don't quit trying. And don't you quit praying. Because he can. If he can help you, he can help anybody. i got to get to my last point because I wanted to be done already. Let me get to my last point and I'll get you out of here. The last one is in verse 16. Jesus Christ can conquer the unconquerable. When even was come, they brought in many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Listen, we're going to start in the Corinthians tonight. I'm going to probably, it's going to be a little different style than my norm. So just be here and find out whether it's good or not. And then you can determine whether or not you want to come back. But we're going to go through the book of Corinthians. And I'm going to get into some of this stuff a little more. Let me just tell you this. When it comes to devil possession, it's real. And not everybody that has mental problems is devil possessed. So don't be a jack leg and an amateur and start labeling people when you don't know. And I can show you from the Bible that some people are truly sick in the mind and they're not devil-possessed, okay? But I won't run that down right now. But when there is an issue like that, it is above your pay grade and above my pay grade. But when you can't, Jesus can. He's speaking to those people that are devil-possessed and with his word, the spirits are coming out of them. Impossible cases, no man can help them, but Jesus Christ can and as he's speaking to them, they're being healed with his word. Look at verse 17 and we're done. It says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by Isaiah, a prophet saying himself, bear our infirmities, took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. You know what that means? You realize Jesus Christ is the atonement for the sins of the world. Did you ever stop and notice that when that crown of thorns was placed on his head, it was a crown of thorns? Preacher, okay. Yeah, I meant to say that on purpose. Did you ever notice the crown of thorns was a crown of thorns? Did you ever go back in your Bible and see where the word thorns first shows up? It's in Genesis chapter 3. You know what it is? It's the curse, the, the, the curse of sin. You ever notice in your Bible it talks about the whole creation groaning and travailing together in pain? You ever see the verses where it says the trees are going to clap their hands? Do you ever see where the Lord said if these hold their peace, the rocks are going to cry out? You understand that Jesus Christ paid for the sin of the world. He took the curse upon himself. Hey, he's going to right all the wrongs, even for nature itself. Do you understand the power and the gravity and the extent to which Jesus Christ went to eradicate the curse of sin? He is wiping the whole thing clean. His blood went into the ground. There was more going on on the cross of Calvary when the devil put it at the Lord and when the Lord took the curse and he took the wrath of God when he allowed that crown of thorns, that curse, that curse to be put on his head. He took it for us. If he can do all that, he can take care of you. He can clean you up. He can take care of your acquaintances and he can conquer the unconquerable. The question is, Will you worship him even if he doesn't? You understand the day is coming when he will. Did he not take the curse of sin upon himself? The crown of thorns upon his head? Have any of you had to pull any thorns out? Around your house? Around your garden? I got to drive by those raspberry bushes every time I'm doing the riding mower and I got to put my foot out there and push those things away because they'll catch my leg or they'll catch my arm and just shred me. Well, if the Lord really was the Lord, he took the crown of thorns, if he paid the atonement for the sin of the world, took care of the curse, why'd that just, ow, oh, that hurt? I don't believe him anymore. You got to understand the day is coming when he's going to take care of all that stuff. He already paid for it. In his timing, it's all going to be gone. But for now, we still have some issues. And he can, he can, he can in your lifetime. But even if he doesn't, you still have to be willing to say, Lord, I know I'm not worthy. 
And I'm asking you to do this. And if it be your will, and Lord, I'm just going to say this, I'm going to keep after you. As long as you put breath in my lungs, I'm going to keep asking. But I'm going to worship you and trust you, even if you say no. Because I know when I can't, you can. I got nowhere else to turn. When I can't, you can. Let's stand to our feet this morning, if you would, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to give you an opportunity. I don't know what the Lord may have been dealing with your heart about this morning.